Well, we are uh, kind of wrapping up just a two-part series on marriage called It's Complicated. Now, if you've ever been on Facebook, you know that there are kind of different relationship statuses that you can check. And there's things like in a relationship, single, engaged, divorced, uh, widowed, married. But there's also one you can check that says It's Complicated. Now, I've been on Facebook before, and I've seen some of my friends who are married go from a status of being married to going to It's Complicated. And that's always sad news to see that, you know? There's, what, what's going on in that marriage that, that led them to, to make that status change? But to be honest, if we're really being honest, all relationships are complicated, aren't they? And especially marriages. I mean, you take two unique, imperfect people and unite them in the most intimate bond, and things are going to get complicated. All marriages are complicated. But in this series, what we're trying to do is we want to sort of uncomplicate marriage a little bit. We, we made that term up, by the way, uncomplicate. So what we're going to do in the series, or what we've been doing, is we're focusing our attention on one small section of Scripture in Genesis. And though it's a short uh, verse, though it's a short section of Scripture, it gives us incredible insights into the dynamics of marriage. Now this Scripture is the first passage written about the first marriage in human history before sin entered the world and complicated things. It's the very first statement about marriage. And in this statement, we see two things that should be happening in a marriage. And if we would just do these two things, it would help uncomplicate our marriage. I thought about after the series is over, writing a little book, and you know, I could say, uh, do these two things and simplify your marriage. It's two easy steps to a simplified marriage and make millions of dollars, right? The problem is the, these two things, these two steps aren't, they're not really easy steps, right? They're not. They, they require constant attention, not just before we're married, but when we're married as well and throughout our marriages. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and it's the second chapter of the Bible. We're going to be keying in on verse 24. That's our main verse for this scripture. And then we'll kind of look at it in its broader context. So Genesis 2, 24 says this about marriage. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and the two become one flesh. And so, for one week of this series, we're talking about leaving, right? A man leaves his father and mother, and the other week, we're talking about uniting, or as the King James Version calls it, cleaving. Leaving and cleaving. Uniting, all right? And so, last week, we kind of flipped things around for you guys. Uh, Jeff was here, and he talked about the uniting part, and I was in Taze Valley, and I was talking about the leaving, and then we're flipping things today, so we're talking about leaving here, and Dave will be here next week. Well, he's here this morning, but he was, he was on a two-week uh, break. I think it was a vacation right? He was working on some doctoral stuff. So uh, I'm here this morning for that reason. So for these two weeks, though, we're asking the questions, what does it mean for a man to leave his father and mother? Right? What, what's going on there? And what does it mean for him to be united to his wife and the two become one flesh? Now, you could go to marriage seminars and read lots of books on the topic of marriage and go to marriage counselors, and these things are all wonderful things to do. They're all helpful. Uh, but the writer of Genesis looks back on the very first marriage relationship before sin entered the world and complicated things, and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, look, this is what should be happening in a marriage. If we would just do these two things, leave and cleave, leave and unite, then our marriages would be so much stronger. They'd be less complicated, and they truly would be two becoming one flesh. Now, I realize in this room we have a lot of different people in a lot of different stages of life, people who could check just about any of those relational statuses on Facebook. And you may be thinking some things. You may be thinking, look, I don't want to hear another marriage series, right? I don't want anything to do with marriage. Or, look, I'm single right now. That's, that's for later down the road. I don't want to hear any of this. Or, look, I've been searching for years for a spouse. I don't think I'll any, ever find one, so I'm, I'm just done with marriage. Or maybe you're, you're saying, look, I, I've been burned by marriage before. I don't want anything to do with marriage, so I don't even want to hear this. Or maybe you've been in a marriage that's been going strong for years and years and years, and you're thinking, oh, what else can I learn, right? Here's the thing. If you've ever thought about getting married, wondered what it would be like to be married, have been burned by a previous marriage, or just getting started in a marriage, or have been married for 75 years, I believe there's something you can gain from taking a deeper look at this scripture. And so that's what we're going to do. So let's, let's kind of take a broader uh, look at the context of this passage. We're going to look at Genesis 2, 18 through 24. And we're going to look at what God says about marriage at the very beginning of the Bible. 
Now, marriage is the, the one institution that God establishes before sin enters the world, before the fall. This can't be said of any other institution. It can't be said of government. It can't be said of the church. Only about marriage. So in Genesis 1, if you want to back up a little and think about this, in Genesis 1, we have the description of the days of creation, right? And then in the start of Genesis 2, it goes into more detail about how man was created from the dust of the ground and God breathed life into the man. And then it goes into describing the Garden of Eden and where God instructs man not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's where we pick up things in verse 18. We're just going to kind of break it down as we go a little bit. So verse 18 says this, Genesis 2:18. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So let's stop there and make a few comments about this. First, to be alone, as the Bible uses it here, is not the same thing as to be single. Now, a lot of people misunderstand this. They think that they, they're the same thing. To be alone means to be single, and that's not how it is. To be alone biblically means to lack a sense of connection and attachment. To love and to be loved. All human beings, whether married or single, need that, right? Adam wasn't alone because he was single. He was alone because he was literally the only human on the face of the planet at that time. And so I say this because increasingly in our society, people live such isolated lives, don't they? They pull back. I was reading a study just last week of, of college students, and they were saying that college students are having less face-to-face -face interaction with their friends and more interaction on social media. And what it's producing is more depression, right? There's something where, where these people need that interaction face-to-face -face that they're not getting, and they're, they're missing that sense of community, and it's, it's, it's hurting them. And so, that, you know, social media can give you some sense of connection, but it just doesn't do what, what, it, what a face-to-face -face interaction does. And so people nowadays are living so much more isolated lives. They're more connected than ever, but they're more isolated than ever. And what they do, and this is important, what they do is, is they put pressure on a romantic relationship, especially a marriage, to take away all of their aloneness. All of it in one person. Putting a lot of pressure on that one marriage, and it just doesn't work that way. That's not how we were meant to live. God doesn't say it's not good to be single. That, that would be like telling Jesus and the Apostle Paul, the way you're living just isn't good because you're not married. That, that, that's not it. But God does say it's not good to be alone. And we want our church to be a place where nobody is alone. Right? That's why we push so much relational discipleship. That's why we, we push and we beg and we try and get you to be involved in a small group because we don't want anyone to stand alone. And there's some effort you got to put into that too, right? And so we want to be a place where, where nobody is alone and God says nobody ought to be alone. And then God says, so I'm going to make a, a, a suitable helper for Adam. Now that word helper sometimes gets distorted as well. Does that mean a wife is supposed to be the assistant junior subordinate to the husband? No, that's not what it means. In fact, let me help you kind of understand that word. The, the Hebrew word for helper that's used in this passage is also the same word that's used in Deuteronomy 33, 29, where it says, God is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. So that same word helper shows up in that passage, but it's, it's used to describe who? It's used to describe God. It's, it's not like a junior assistant subordinate, right? Uh, it's used more often, the word helper is used more often in the Old Testament to describe God than anyone else. So since God is called a helper, and the wife is called a helper, does that mean that the wife is supposed to be the superior officer over the husband? And the answer is, yes, I'm saying it in the camera because my wife isn't here. Yes, honey, that's what it means. No, it doesn't mean that either, right? Since God is called helper and the wife is called helper, it doesn't mean that, that she's supposed to rule over the husband either. Biblically, the helper is the one who provides for what is lacking in the other. So let's go on. Verse 19, it says this. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature... That was its name. So the, the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So there was no helper in all of creation that was suitable to meet Adam's need for community. And so what did God do? God decides to knock Adam out. It says in verse 21, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. 
Now, God could have made a woman from the dust of the ground, just like he made Adam, but he chose a different method, didn't he? One with more significance. He chose to begin with the rib from Adam to show, as some would say, that the unique closeness of the marriage relationship, their, their partnership, their companionship, their mutual submission to each other. It gives us an image that man and woman are linked side by side, right? No other being in nature was created in this way. So the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and then I love this. It says that God brought the woman to the man. That's a, little, that's a tender little verse, isn't it? God brought the woman to the man. It's like, think about this. If you, if you love someone and you've, you, you decide you want to give something to them that's very special, you make it with your hands, right? You don't just want it to show up at their doorstep unannounced without you being there. You want to take it to them. You want to give it to them. You want to see their reaction when you give it to them because you know that they're going to love it. And so God brings Eve, this naked Eve, to Adam. And what does Adam say? He says, whoa, man. And that's where we get the term woman. Whoa, man. No. <laughs> the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And then comes this key verse to our series, this, this classic verse of, about how a marriage works. Verse 24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now this verse is foundational to marriage. It is the foundational passage on marriage in Scripture. It is vitally important. In fact, when Jesus talked about marriage in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, he quoted this verse. When Paul talked about marriage in 1 Corinthians 6 and Ephesians 5, he quoted this verse, right? So though this passage follows the first husband and wife, we know that Adam didn't have to leave his father and mother. He didn't have a father and mother. So really, this passage is a teaching for us, isn't it? It's a teaching to, to future marriages about what should be going on. And so this leaving that Genesis is speaking of involves so much more than just moving out of the house. In fact, in the ancient world, uh, uh, very often the groom would actually stay in the family compound and live with his wife. So this is, this is way more than just talking about geographical relocation when it's talking about leaving, isn't it? See, leaving is something that, that must happen in the heart and the will, first and foremost. It's deeply personal. I must leave old allegiances, leave old emotional commitments and entanglements, and make this other person, my spouse, my top human relational priority. Now, obviously, God is my top priority way above anything else, but my spouse is my top human priority. And so I leave the patterns and assumptions and expectations and demands and habits that I grew up with, that I've grown accustomed to and claimed to as my own, and I allow my spouse the freedom and space to be herself because she's different than me. Have you ever noticed it seems like married couples are so often find each other and they're so different from each other, right? I mean, you think about, you know, you and your spouse if you're married right now or people you know, you can think about how different they, they are, right? And it's just little things. I remember, you know, how, how Sarah and I grew up was very different. How we communicated in our homes growing up was very different. I remember the first time that I went to see, uh, to visit Sarah's family. I had dinner with her mom and her brother and her. And we sat down for dinner and it was so quiet. It was just so quiet. And I sat there thinking, how come they're not talking to me? And I kept thinking, like, they must hate me. They, they're, they're not saying anything to me. And I didn't know what to expect. Because in my house, and when Sarah went to my house to, to, to have dinner for the very first time, it was my dad and mom. It was my, my brother and, and his wife, my sister and her husband, my, my little sister. And we just had to fight to get a word in, right? It was just chaos. And, you, you know, my, my mom is typical Northeast Ohio blunt, and she'll just say it like it is. And, and, and Sarah walked out from that going, I'm, I don't know what to think of this. I think she was terrified. And so just these differences come into play when you, when you get married. And when two individuals come together in marriage, it's always complicated because these two individuals are so different, aren't they? They're so different. Check out this video real quick here and you can see a little bit about how couples are so different. What are you doing? Drying my hands. Those are the decorative towels. You can't use them. Why? Because they're decorative. Then why are they out? Because they're decorative. That's literally the stupidest thing I've ever heard. 
That is disgusting. Can you please go do it in the bathroom? Why? I don't want to miss the dessert round. No, you do this all the time, and I'm constantly finding pe- I don't know where that went. How wonderful life is. Now you're in my world. My no, world. No, it's it my is, world. No, it is the world. Close all the way. Close all the way. Close all the way. Isn't that nice? Don't give him that. His stomach can't handle it. He'll get sick. Oh, he's a cat. He's fine. Told you. Shut up. Did you take a lactate? No. I'll be fine. <laughs> Told ya. Shut up. You know where I saw this earlier? The bathtub. Oh yeah, I needed to scrub it. Yeah, but I just found it in the sink. I needed to do dishes after. What? It touched soap. If it touched soap, that means it's clean. You can't just make up your own rules to suit you as we play the game. Well, stop taking the fun out of it then. I'm not taking the fun out of it. What takes the fun out of it is when you cheat. <gasps> What's up? What's up? You left the toilet seat up. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Just put it down. Don't pull my underwear. Stop pulling my underwear. Ah! Girl, wake it off! We're not made of money, you know. Cause lights are money. Remember that time you threw up? Some of you guys could relate to some of those, right? Arguments over little differences. And I often tell couples when I'm doing premarital counseling that differences really aren't the problem, right? Difference is what makes marriage possible. It's the mystery of two becoming one flesh. But you can allow, either allow those differences to become a source of frustration and conflict, or you can use those differences to complement one, one another and help each other to be the helpmate for your husband or wife. So often when people get married, they start thinking, well, this is a problem because they're different. They do this different, and it's not right, and they seek to change the other person. But the Bible says that marriage doesn't start with the other person changing. Marriage starts with leaving. Marriage starts with leaving. And so we're going to talk about what that means. I, I, I hate to leave, and the reason I hate to leave is not because I hate to go somewhere. I hate to leave because I hate to pack. You know what I mean? I hate packing to leave. That's, that's the worst part of it. And so I get in trouble a lot because uh, I am a typical overpacker. My wife makes fun of me all the time for, for overpacking. I'm like, well, I might need this, or I might need that. We might be doing this, or I got to take clothes for that. And, and so she makes fun of me. She says, I, I'm, I'm worse than a girl in that aspect. I tell her, quit being so chauvinistic, you know, quit being a chauvinist pig. She's perpetuating stereotypes when she says that, you know. And so, so I, I'm an overpacker, and I, I know it. But here's the thing. Uh, too often, when, when a, a spouse leaves their father and mother to get married, they overpack as well. They take too much baggage with them. And there are some things that we need to leave behind. Now, inevitably, I'm going to talk about some things that we need to be doing in our marriages, some things that we maybe need to leave behind, some things that need to happen. And here's what's going to happen. I'm going to hear a husband cough and go, <coughs> you need to listen to this, honey. Or I'm going to see a wife just elbow her husband. You hear that? You hear that? Right? And, and here's what I'd like to see happen instead. I'd like to see some self-reflection happen instead. Because you can't change someone else, but you can change yourself. So here are some things that we probably should leave behind before we get married, and really we're going to need to continue to work on them even when we're married to make sure that they don't find their way back into a marriage. And some of you have already brought these into marriage, and you're going to have to work to, to, to get rid of them now. Okay, so these are kind of in no particular order, but let me just pull out some things here. The first is, is this is a credit card, and, and when I was in college, my parents gave me a credit card that was connected to their account. It was for emergency purposes only, right? So they, they gave me this, and, and I had connection there. And what this represents that I should not be bringing into my marriage is that I need to leave my parents' provision. I'm no longer under their provision anymore. Instead, I, I'm to be the provider, right? And, and so we've got to leave behind my parents' provision. Next one, this is another hard one to see, but 
This is an auto insurance policy. And so, again, when I was growing up, when I was living in my parents' household, uh, I was covered under their auto insurance. I was covered under their medical insurance. They took care of me. They looked out for me. And what this represents is, when I get married, I need to leave behind my parents' protection. No longer am I un under their umbrella of protection. Instead, I am to be a protector. I am to protect my wife. I am to protect my children. I am to protect my vows that I have made to my wife, right? And so we move from being under parents' protection to being the protector. And we need to leave behind your, our parents' protection. Now this one may be a little um, odd. This right here is probably the most giant Christmas stocking you've ever seen, right? Um, when I was a kid, we would wake up on Christmas morning. We'd go into the living room uh, after everyone was finally up, and we would open a gift from our, st and, and we'd dump out our stockings, open a gift from in there, and whatever was in there, and then we'd open a gift from Santa, and it was usually a, a smaller gift because my parents didn't want Santa, you know, overshadowing them. And then we would go to get breakfast, and then we'd come back and open the rest of the gifts. And that was kind of our family tradition. When you get married, though, this represents that we need to leave behind our family traditions. Now, this doesn't mean that we, we get rid of all of them altogether or never see our families. That's not what I'm meaning. But at some point, you've got to start making your own traditions, right? It's, it's, it's your family now. And so, Sarah and I, we have our own traditions nowadays. Uh, we we don't do Santa in our household. It's not because we think, well, if you take the letters of Santa and mix them up, it becomes Satan, and that's what he really... No, we don't believe that. We just don't do it in our household. Uh, but, you know, we have to come up with our own traditions. Our, our families live far apart. And so, you know... Uh, one year, this year, we went to Cleveland for Thanksgiving, and we stayed here for Christmas, and then we'll probably flip-flop next year. We, we've had to come up with just our own way of doing things, right? Your families may n live near each other, and so you have to do like 12 Christmases each, you know, on one day, and it, because it's your family traditions, and your great-great-grandma Helen would croak if you, she found out that you weren't coming, you know. And, and so at some point, though, this may be very difficult to leave behind. And I'm, again, I'm not saying leave everything behind. You want to incorporate family into things. But at some point, it's got to be your family traditions. You've got to come up together with your spouse how you're going to handle things, right? This next one, this, this is a phone. I think it's from like 1999. I don't know. But it's a phone. And, and what this represents is I need to leave behind my parents' decision-making. Here's what happens all too often in a marriage. One spouse runs to their parents, asks their advice, seeks their counsel, talks things over with their parents before they talk things over with their spouse. Now, this doesn't mean that you don't listen to your parents' advice. This doesn't mean you ignore their wisdom. But you've got a different partner in life now. You need to talk things over with them first, right? And so you don't go to your parents first for everything, or for everything. You don't, you don't go there to seek their approval or constantly seeking out their advice. You, you begin to make decisions with your spouse. And so there are some things that you got to leave behind in that aspect. This next one was very difficult for me. In fact, it's still very difficult for me. This is my per, you know, personal calendar here. And what this represents is the fact that I need to leave behind my time. My time. And, and again, I've had a hard time with this one. Uh, but I, I no longer solely determine my schedule, how I will use my time. In fact, usually on Sunday nights, my wife and I get together now that she's working full time again, and we go over the calendar for the week and decide how we, we are going to handle our time together. And, and, you know, I might not need to be out this evening. She might need to be out this evening. How are we going to handle the kids in those situations? It's no longer my time anymore. I got to tell you, I really did a bad job of this early on in my marriage. My first full summer that I was married, I was in youth ministry in Columbus, Ohio, and I had scheduled like a junior high mission trip, a senior high mission trip, a junior high week at camp, a senior high week at Summer in the Sun. And I think there was something else in there. There was something like five weeks where I was going to be doing something, you know, away from the home that summer. And, and I didn't consult my wife about it. I just kind of did it. I kind of, you know, scheduled it out. And first, that's just not sustainable, and second, that was just rude of me. We were in this together, and I was, I was trying to handle things like it's my time, I can do with it what I want, and it's not my time anymore. It's our time. So I've got to leave behind this idea that it's my time. This next one, I'll pull out a picture here. And uh, this is, this is uh, I, I don't have 
pictures of past girlfriends, right? Uh, so this represents leaving behind past relationships, but um, this is the picture that I put in there. You can go ahead and put it because every girl since Sarah just looks like this now. Sorry. So <laughs> but I, leave, I leave behind past relationships. Look, when I marry someone, this is, this is the last person I will court, last person I will date, last person I will marry, last person I will be intimate with. Hopefully it's the first person I'm also intimate with, right? Okay? But some of you, uh, th this isn't your first marriage, right? And, and so you have to leave behind past relationships, and it's, it's a little more difficult because there are past hurts in there, and there are past issues and past expectations. Some of you, some of you have, have suffered abuse in past relationships. And your spouse or your future spouse, they need to know about this. They need to know this, and you, you probably need to get some counseling to be able to leave this behind because you're going to have some trust issues maybe that you bring in or intimacy issues if you aren't able to leave this behind, right? Some of you have, some of you have gone against God's word in regard to sexual intimacy. Jeff alluded to this last week when he talked about uh, uniting and becoming one flesh. When, when you unite yourself in sexual relationships with someone, you are becoming one flesh with them. And so to leave that relationship behind, there has to be a tearing of the flesh, literally, right? You, you're taking a part of them with you into the next relationship. And so from that point on, you, you need to seek forgiveness from God and accept it. And you need to seek forgiveness from your spouse or future spouse to be able to leave that relationship in the past. Now, there are times when you can, you, you really to be honest, can't completely leave a relationship in the past. Why? There are kids involved. The father or mother of a child. And let's just face it. Everyone brings baggage into a relationship. Everyone brings too much into a marriage. But this one, your future spouse needs to be ready to handle because you're going to have to juggle this situation delicately. But it's not just past romantic relationships we're talking about here, right? Maybe you used to play Halo with your buddies for five hours every, you know, three times a week. Maybe you used to call your, you know, your, your girlfriend for an hour each night. I'm not saying you have to leave those relationships in the past completely, but again, that's not sustainable. That's probably not healthy for your marriage relationship, and you're, you're probably going to need to adjust those relationships that maybe you've had with some of your friends, Right? And so, we, we've got to be cautious of some, some of these things. And so, we, we've got to leave behind these past relationships. Now, this one is a, a car payment book. Now, that, that may seem a little bit weird. Maybe you're thinking you've got to leave debt behind when you go into a marriage. And, and definitely, you need to be cautious about how you're spending your money and what you're bringing to marriage debt-wise. But that's not what I'm actually talking about here. Um, maybe your parents didn't handle finances very well. Maybe they were a little bit frivolous or they got themselves into a lot of debt. Maybe they didn't teach you about money very well. And so you don't really know how to handle money very well. Uh, maybe you've picked up on some things that, that your parents do that, that you really shouldn't do. And so what this represents is the fact that you need to leave behind your parents' sins and bad habits. Right? At some point you come to the realization when you're growing up that your parents aren't perfect. They do some things wrong, and inevitably, your parents have passed down some bad habits onto you, or even worse, some sin. Maybe you have a sharp tongue like your dad, or you're codependent like your mom. Maybe your dad was a spender, or your mom was an alcoholic. I know with me, I have to be very cautious uh, that, that I, I don't uh, perpetuate the short temper that my dad has. He wasn't violent, but he was very quick to get angry, and I find that in myself sometimes, and I've got to be care careful to leave that behind. I've got to be careful that I don't overextend myself with my work, because I've seen that happen with my mom. She, she dives into things and works too hard and overextends herself, and I've got to be cautious that I don't pick up on that, because I have a tendency to do that. So there are some things that I have to be cautious of, and there are some things that you know you, your parents do that you have to be cautious that don't find themselves in your marriage as well, right? And so we've got to be cautious that those things are left behind. This next one 
is uh, dryer sheets. I'm not sure if I really knew what these were until I was married. Uh, when, I was, when I was younger, uh, my parents did, my mom particularly, did the laundry for us. I, I would fold it, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't know I was supposed to separate the lights and darks. I didn't know all this stuff until I went to college and all my whites turned into pinks, you know, and that was kind of awkward. But, uh, you know, there are, some, there are some things that I had to learn, and, 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 and also I had to realize that I could not put those same expectations on Sarah. Should I really expect her to do my laundry for me? Some of you are like, yeah, you should. No, no, I shouldn't. So here's what I have to do and what we all need to do. We need to leave behind expectations that, that, that you put on your spouse. Expectations that you put on your spouse. Maybe for you, it's your mom always cooked the meals for you, and so now you, you expect that from your spouse. Maybe uh, your dad always put gas in the car for you. Maybe you expect your spouse to be Mr. Fix-It, right? Or, or your, your spouse to be the maid of the house. And so you put these expectations on them before you even get married. Maybe, maybe your parents didn't do anything for you. Maybe you learned to be independent on your own. And so you expect your spouse to leave you alone and let you do things on your own. And then you leave them alone and you expect them to do stuff on your, their own. And so we, we put these expectations on ourselves. Uh, I know this may sound funny, but I, I almost brought with me for this one a condom. <laughs> and you're like, oh, why would you do that? Because some of you guys have crazy expectations that you brought into your marriage for your wife or your husband, right? You, you were thinking, well, 24 hours in a day, that's eight times a day, right? You know, and, and that's the, the sexual expectations that you may have brought in. I know my wife had those expectations of me, and I had to tell her, look, honey, I'm not a machine, right? So... <laughs> I said that in the last service. I'll be sleeping on the couch uh, tonight. But we all bring in expectations, right? But, but even sexually, we, we bring in expectations. And in our culture where sex is so sensationalized, you may have these expectations of, of fireworks and everything is just amazing and beautiful and wonderful, and you've got to leave those expectations behind. And I've got to tell you that, that there is an epidemic of, of pornography in our culture, and it is just making this so much worse. We have these ridiculous expectations for our future mates or for our current spouses because, because we've dived into to pornography or, or something that's like pornography, like books or movies like Fifty Shades of Grey. It's basically like pornography, right? And so we have these crazy expectations that we've brought in. We've got to leave those behind. And if there are some things that are perpetuating, again, those, those expectations sexually, we need to rid ourselves of those, particularly in regard to pornography. Well, this next one is the remote control. I had a bunch of guys coming up to me last week at Taze Valley, and they were, they were like, well, I was tracking with you the whole sermon until you got to this one. They said, you went from preaching to meddling. Right? <laughs> we like the remote control, guys, don't we? I remember before I was married, when I was single, I'd wake up in the morning, turn on the TV, and what did it go straight to? Sports Center, right? You know, and I watched a lot of football. I watched a lot of basketball. And now it seems like, if those of you have Dish Network, I hit 112 a lot. Does anyone know what 112, channel 112 is? HGTV. It's pitiful. I know. I can't believe it. But what this represents is I, I need to leave behind my selfishness. Right? I need to leave behind my selfishness. I can't solely determine how I'm going to spend my downtime. I can't always be in control and have things go my way. And really, that's what a lot of this comes down to, right? Much of what we're talking about this morning involves us leaving behind our selfishness. And so the Bible says that marriage really starts by leaving. I leave my self-centered stance. I leave my assumption that my perspective is right and natural. I leave my demand to get my own way. I leave my pride, my defensiveness. I leave my right to get and get and get because... That's what love does. One of the most beautiful passages about love is 1 Corinthians 13. You'll hear it often quoted in, in weddings. And it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, that love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. You see, leaving isn't just something you do initially when you get married. You are constantly leaving, you're constantly learning really what it means to leave your selfishness, to love, 
to support and be with the helpmate that God has allowed you to spend your life with. So one more thing, and this is something you bring into your marriage, but it also represents something else that you leave behind, and that, that's my Bible. Obviously, I want to bring this into my marriage. In fact, please bring it into your marriage and read it and study it and live it. Hopefully, it's worn, worn out before you get into your marriage. It should be falling apart because that represents a life that is not falling apart, right? So you bring that Bible into the, to your marriage, but what this represents is it represents the, notion, the, the fact that you need to leave behind the notion that my spouse will complete me, fulfill me, satisfy me, Right? You see, when you have this notion that your spouse will complete you, that your spouse is the only one that satisfies you or fulfills you, what you're doing is you are making your spouse into an idol God. Because only God is the one who can take that place. Only Jesus can fully and finally satisfy you. You see, you will never be complete. You will never feel fulfilled. fulfilled. You will never be satisfied until you are following Jesus and finding your identity in him. And so the Bible says, when you get married, there is a leaving that takes place. The question you need to be asking is, what is found, if you are married, what has found its way into our marriage that needs to be left behind? What can I do to rid myself of that? If you're not married, these are some things that you need to be thinking about before you get married. What type of baggage am I about to drag into this relationship? And what do I need to, to, to unpack and leave behind? This morning, though, we want to offer an invitation like we do every week here. We want to offer you an invitation to leave something behind as well. We want to offer you the invitation to leave your life behind and follow Jesus, to completely surrender to him and follow after him. Let's, let's face it. Our marriages will never be what God intended them to be unless we are fully surrendered to Jesus. And so... That should be the first thing that we leave behind is the life that, that we live for ourselves and now we follow Jesus and live our lives for him. And so this morning, if you've never placed your trust in Jesus, if you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, if you've never followed that up with baptism, which is just also an incredible picture of, of surrendering and leaving behind your old life and coming up a new creation, we want to give you the opportunity this morning to respond to Jesus, to give your life over to him, to surrender your life to him. So will you stand with me and, and let's pray together and then we're going to sing one last song and if you have a, a response that you need to make today, I'm going to be up here to your left. You can come on up and we can talk what, about what that means. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how practical it is, how true it is, how it's your words coming to life for us. And God, I pray that we would study it and learn it. And by doing so, we would know you more and more. And as we come to know you more, we would understand how much you love us, how much you are for us, how much hope you bring to this world and, and to our lives. I pray as we get to know you more, we would understand that you are so worth giving up everything for to follow. So God, I pray that we would leave behind our past lives and what we've been living for and repent and turn to you and follow you. God, I pray for our marriages. There are some even in this room this morning that are struggling in their marriages. Their marriage is in crisis. They're in conflict. There's a lot of pain. And I pray that they would understand that you want to bring healing and restoration to their marriages and that they can stick with it that they would seek your face and follow you and, and, and seek to make things better. God, I pray for those who have already been burned by a marriage before, that, that they would seek healing from you as well. But God, I just want to lift up the marriages in this room, that, that our marriages in this church would get stronger and stronger and stronger, that, the, that they would be a light in our culture where marriages are failing and they're just giving up so easily that, that, that the marriages in our church would stand out and that people would see that there is something different in the marriages at Gateway. And it's because you are involved, you are the center of those marriages. And so God, I pray that you would do your work in our marriages and in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. This morning, if you have a decision to make about Jesus, I'll be up here to your right as we sing this last song. Will you sing with us?